Let's open our Bibles today to the book of Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And let me tell you that I'm going to begin a message today that I really will not finish until next week. Now, I will finish the message in one sense of the word today. It will be complete. But next week I'm going to be dealing with the objections to this message, or at least the leading objection, I should say. And so today we're going to look at Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13, and I'm going to start a two-part series on the biblical doctrine of self-defense. Or as one of my friends suggested, maybe the correct title should be the Glock Doctrine. But anyhow, uh, notice Exodus chapter 20, 20 and verse 13. Very simple, straightforward statement, thou shalt not kill. Everyone recognizes that as the sixth commandment. Thou shalt not kill. Now, the sixth commandment is indeed very short. But the question you have to ask is, what in the world does it mean? I mean, does it mean that life can never ever be taken at all? or that it can be taken only upon certain terms. Well, before I get to explaining this passage, I want to give you some history. In fact, one of my favorite stories is about the old Puritan or pilgrim pastor who was on his way to church, and he had the blunderbuss on his shoulder. And as he was walking to church carrying that blunderbuss, a man walked up to him and said, Pastor, wait a minute, I've got some questions to ask you. Do you not believe in the absolute sovereignty of God? And the pastor responded, well, yes, of course I do. Well, he says, do you not believe that when it comes your time to die, that you're going to die, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it? He said, I believe that wholeheartedly. He said, do you not believe that God is in control of everything? The pastor said, yes, I believe that. So the man said, Pastor, if you believe that God is sovereign, and if you believe that God is in control of everything, and if you believe that when it comes your time to die, you're going to die, and there's not one thing you can do about it, may I ask, why are you carrying that blunderbuss to church? The pastor responded, oh, that's easy. In case I meet an Indian whose time it is to die. So, very obviously, uh, our forefathers did indeed go to church armed. Most of us have never thought about this and probably never comprehended that not only the fact that our forefathers always went around armed, they even went to church armed. I have a book in my library entitled, The Sabbath of Puritan New England. It's a very old book. It was written by Alice Morris Earle, and thankfully, that book has been reprinted, and it is also available on the internet as well. And the book really is very meaty, and it shows why our forefathers went around armed, and even a church on the Lord's Day. In fact, an interesting concept that in order to sanctify the loading of their weapons on the Lord's Day, the pastor told them that they were not to discharge those weapons unless it happened to be at an Indian or a wolf, which was, of course, their two main enemies at that time. But Trumbull, who was the historian of Connecticut, in his MacFingal, writes a little poem jesting and making fun of this carrying weapons to church. And here's this little poem. So once for fear of Indian beating, our grandsires wore their guns to meeting. Each man equipped each Sunday morn with psalm book, shot, and powder horn, and looked in form as all must grant, like the ancient true church militant. Well, that was his little poem, and certainly it was neat. But In the formation of our nation, all bore arms and all bore them even to church on the Lord's Day. In fact, it was required by law that you go to church armed. For instance, in 1640 in Massachusetts, it was ordered that attendants at churches should carry, and I'm quoting, a competent number of pieces, fixed and complete, with powder, shot, and swords every Lord's Day to the meeting house. So you not only had to carry your rifle, your musket, your muzzle loader, your blunderbuss, whatever you would have at that particular time, but you were also required to wear a sword as well. In Connecticut in 1643, those who failed to bring their arms to church were fined 12 cents for each offense. Now, 
Of course, you and I don't think too much of 12 cents today, but in 1643, it was probably a pretty good sum. In 1644, there was a law that demanded a fourth part of a trained band, that is a fourth part of trained fighting men, were obligated to come to church armed, and the sentinels were ordered to keep their matches lighted in order that they might fire their matchlock rifles in case of an Indian attack. And of course, I hope that you can picture in your mind armed soldiers sitting maybe in the back of the building, and yet they had a piece of lighter not lit, and it burned all during the church service, so all they had to do was stick it to the matchlock in order to be able to fire. But in 1692, the Connecticut legislature ordered that one-fifth of the soldiers in each town must attend the Sunday meeting. That way, the congregants would be protected by those men. In fact, many of our modern-day habits in this day and time stem from those old days and the honored practices and customs back then. I don't know if you've ever noticed it or not, but in most churches, especially where there are pews, usually men sit on the end of the pews. I noticed that when I was a boy. And when I got grown, I always sit on the end of a pew. Always. And I always wondered, why in the world did men sit on the end of the pews? Well, the answer to that is very simple. Because when they went to church, they went to church armed, and they stacked their rifles in the middle of the aisle. That way, if there was danger, the men could reach out and grab the rifle and be ready to defend themselves and their families. The women and the children were inside the pews. That way, they were not in the way, and they were more easily and more readily protected. Now, I like this next little tidbit of history. You know, today, usually when a pastor finishes preaching on Sunday, he always walks to the back of the church, and of course, people greet him as they walk out. Have you ever wondered how that custom originated and why that is done? What do you say? Well, pastor, they, the, the preachers do that. Be, that way the people can shake their hands. Listen, I don't have to go to a back of a church building to have my hand shaken. If you want to shake my hand, you can walk forward as easily as I can walk backwards or to the side. It doesn't matter. No, the reason the pastor always went to the back of the church was because the pastor was the under shepherd. He was responsible for the flock and he was the one who always went to the doors first and looked out first to make sure there were no Indians around or no dangers lurking around. And after the pastor then gave the all clear sign, then the men came out with their weapons, and of course the women and children after them. Now, the practice of the pastor going to the back of the church originated from the uh, fact that the pastor was not only the lookout and responsible to discern whether or not there was danger, Uh, But there's another practice as well. For instance, in Concord, New Hampshire, the church had the practice that all men stack their arms in the middle of the aisles around a post. However, their honored pastor, listen carefully, who was not only a good shot, but possessed the best rifle in the settlement, preached with his rifle by the pulpit. And then when he went to the back door, he always carried that weapon with him in order that he might be ready to defend his congregation. In June, on June the 17th, 1775, right before the War of Independence started in, in, uh, in all of its greatness, I should say, the Provincial Congress or the Continental Congress recommended that all men within 20 miles of the seacoast carry their arms and ammunition with them to the meeting house, not only on the Lord's Day, but during every other day for public worship as well. And certainly the recommendation was seen to be beneficial many times before the war was brought to an end in 1783. Now, I have a question for you. In light of the historical examples that I've just given, were our forefathers correct? Were they biblical? 
Well, let me answer that for you. I'm going to assure you that they were correct, they were right, and they were biblical. But before I really begin to expound Scripture, I want to give you some modern-day illustrations of why it was absolutely, and it still is absolutely necessary, for men to be armed. For instance, this took place in Cape Town, South Africa, July the 25th, 1993, at 7.15 p.m. It happened to be St. James Church, which was the largest church there in Cape Town. Then on Sunday night, they had more than a 1,000 in attendance. Let me read the article. Here it is. A group of five terrorists came to St. James Church, the largest evangelical church in Cape Town, shortly after the evening service began. One of the terrorists, wearing a ski mask, rolled a hand grenade into the packed assembly without warning and opened fire with an AK-47. Shooting from the hip as he sprayed the worshipers, a deadly attack that left 12 people dead at that particular count and more than 50 severely wounded. As the terrorist, and by the way, there was another terrorist who was getting ready to throw a hand grenade and open up with an AK-47, and he was deterred, I'll tell you why. When he was getting ready to do that, and by the way, <clears throat> these terrorists were communist guerrillas from the ANC, which was Nelson Mandela's group. But anyhow, uh, there happened to be a missionary in the church, and I'm picking up here, he was a missionary with Frontline Fellowship. He returned fire with his 38 revolver. The masked men dashed to a green Mercedes waiting in the parking lot. As they fled, the missionary, the only armed man in the church, emptied his pistol into the fleeing vehicle, but the terrorists got away. Police said that the missionary's quick action saved at least 100 lives in the church, which averages 1,000 in attendance on Sunday evenings. Now, the only other reason, or the reason the other terrorists did not throw that hand grenade was because the missionary then targeted him and began shooting at him. And so rather than throw his grenade and open up with his AK, he ducked out of the building and went to the car. Now, history will bear out the fact that it's ever been the design and the program of communists and terrorists to attack people where they believe they are the safest. What two places are the safest for an individual? At home and in church. And if you can be shaken in your perception of safety, either at home or in church, then of course you are constantly terrified and constantly in trouble. Now, let's ask several questions. Now, don't answer them out loud. But here are several questions. First of all, was the missionary right to carry a loaded weapon into the Lord's house. We must also ask, was he right in using that weapon in the defense of his life and in the defense of the lives of others as well? We could ask the question like this. Were those Christians in South Africa wrong, wicked, and unbiblical for not wanting to be murdered? And maybe we could suggest that maybe they were not pious enough or spiritual enough to die at that particular time. Well, you know, Christians say, I'm ready to die for the Lord. Well, if you're ready to die for the Lord, why not die at that particular time? Were they just not spiritual enough? Well, let me ask it like this. Would you prefer to be murdered or would you prefer to live? Would you prefer that the communist terrorists die or that an innocent and righteous individual die? Now you say, Brother Weaver, wait a minute now. That happened in 1993 in South Africa, far away from the safety of the United States. Yes, it did. But, listen, August the 12th, 2007, a lone gunman, Iken Elam Simon, opened fire in a Missouri Micronesian church, killing the pastor and two other churchgoers. On May the 20th, 2007, a standoff between police and a, sus a suspect in the shootings of three people in a Moscow, Idaho Presbyterian church ended with three dead, including a police officer. 
Although not a church building, on October the 2nd, 2006, you will remember, in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, a gunman went to, into an army school and killed five girls and then himself. He targeted a religious site. On May the 21st, 2006, in Louisiana, four men were killed by one man at the Church of Jesus Christ. February the 26th, 2006, in Michigan, two people were killed in Zion Hope Missionary Baptist Church by a man who reportedly had gone there looking for his girlfriend. He then later killed himself. April the 9th, 2005, a 27-year-old airman died after being shot at a church in College Park, Georgia, where he'd once worked as a security guard. On March the 12th, 2005, a man walked into the services of the Living Church of God in Milwaukee and opened fire, killing seven people. October the 5th, 2003, a woman walked into Turner Monumental AME Church in Kirkwood, which is east of Atlanta, killing the pastor and two others. And then, of course, on September the 16th, 1999, Seven young people were killed when a man walked into Wedgwood Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas and just simply opened fire. So you don't have to live in South Africa to have danger in your church. Now I want you to look in Exodus 20 and verse 13 again. A very simple verse, thou shalt not kill. By the way, let me make a statement When you read the Ten Commandments, please understand the Ten Commandments are not what some people call Jewish law. The Ten Commandments are God's law given by Moses. If you want Jewish law, then you need to read the Gemara and the Mishnah or the the Talmud, which includes both of those. The Talmud is Jewish law. That is why our Lord got in trouble with those Jews, especially in Matthew 15 and in Mark 7, because they asked him, why do your disciples not keep the tradition of the elders? And Jesus Christ said, why is it with your traditions you make void the law of God? So the Ten Commandments are God's law, and when we read, thou shalt not kill, that is God's law. And I want to emphasize today the biblical doctrine of self-defense. It is biblical. And it is found in the Word of God. Now, in order to be biblical, we have to understand and we must ascertain the meaning of this simple statement, thou shalt not kill. Actually, in the Hebrew, it literally refers to this, thou shalt not murder. In the, in the New Testament, when it is translated in the Greek, it is still, thou shalt not murder. Now, there is a vast difference between murder and self-defense. Taking life may be murder, but it is not always murder. Life may be lawfully taken without murdering. Thus the sixth commandment actually means this, thou shalt do no murder, or thou shalt not take life unjustly, because it is possible to take life justly. In fact, you could interpret it like this. Thou shalt not take life except on God's terms. Since God is the giver of life, God is the one who determines when life may be lawfully and legitimately taken. Now, please don't try to write all of this down. If you want it, I don't mind giving it to you a little bit later. But let me just give you very quickly... 18 reasons that are listed in the Bible why life may be lawfully taken. In fact, in these 18 instances, God demanded that life be taken. We talk about the death penalty. Well, here they are. Number one, life may be taken for murder, but not for accidental killing. Exodus 21, verses 12 through 14. So life may be taken for murder. The murderer shall be put to death. Number two, life may be forfeited for striking or cursing a parent. You'll find that in Exodus 21, 15, Leviticus 29, Proverbs 20, 20, 
Matthew 15, 4, Mark 7 and verse 10. Striking or cursing a parent. Your father and your mother, the death penalty is demanded. Number three, life is to be taken for kidnapping. The kidnapper shall be put to death. Exodus 21, 16, Deuteronomy 24 and verse 7. The death penalty is given for adultery. Leviticus 20, verses 10 through 21. The death penalty is demanded for incest. Leviticus 20, verses 11 and 12 and 14. The death penalty is pronounced for bestiality. Exodus 22, verse 19. Leviticus 20, verses 15 and 16. The death penalty is demanded for sodomy. Leviticus 20, verse 13. The death penalty is demanded for unchastity. Deuteronomy 22, verses 20 through 21. We'll talk about that in a little while. The death penalty is demanded for the rape of a troth virgin. We'll also talk about this. Deuteronomy 22, verses 23 through 27. Tenthly, the death penalty is demanded for witchcraft. Exodus 22, verse 18. God says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Number 11, the death penalty is demanded for offering human sacrifice. Leviticus 20, verse 21, whoever offers someone a sinner as a human sacrifice is to be put to death. Number 12, the death penalty is demanded, listen carefully, for incorrigible delinquency or what you and I would say habitual criminality. You'll find that in Deuteronomy 21, verses 18 through 21. Number 13, the death penalty is demanded for blasphemy. Leviticus 24, 11 through 14, verse 16 and verse 23. Number 14, the death penalty is demanded for Sabbath desecration. You'll find that in Exodus 35 and verse 2 and Numbers 15, 32 through 36. Number 15, the death penalty is demanded for the propagation of false doctrines. You'll find that in Deuteronomy 13. Number 16, the death penalty is demanded for sacrificing to false gods. Exodus 22, verse 20. Number 17, the death penalty is demanded for refusing to, de to abide by the decision of a biblical court of law. You'll find that in Deuteronomy 17, verses 8 through 13. And then number 18, you'll find that the death penalty is demanded for failing to restore the pledge or the bailment. And you will find that in Ezekiel 18, verses 12 through 13. Now, I've just given you 18 reasons with the scripture why God demanded the death penalty in those instances, showing you that, yes, God did demand the death penalty. Now, whether you agree with those 18 instances or not, or whether you understand them or not, is immaterial. If you read the scriptures... The scriptures demand that life may be taken because of these sins and these crimes. So any honest reading of the scripture, therefore, would tell you, yes, life may be lawfully taken. Now, the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, forbids all unjust violence as well as murder. Listen carefully. When God forbids any act, at the same time, he forbids any and everything that would lead up to that act. For instance, if I jumped on Ralph and started beating him, not necessarily with the intent to kill him, I'm just going to give him a good beating. Well, what if he fights back? And what if he's getting the best of me? And the next thing I know, I reach over and pick up a limb and hit him on the head and end up killing him. You, you see what I'm saying? In other words, if God forbids murder, at the same time he forbids unjust violence that would lead up to that murder. Now listen, think about this. I just gave you 18 reasons why life may be lawfully taken. To that we can add a 19th, and I'm not adding to the word of God, I'm going to show it to you. We could add the 19th, which would be self-defense. Because self-defense is indeed biblical and scriptural. Now, I want you to understand that God's law is normally given to us in negative terms. For instance, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Out of the Ten Commandments, only two are positive. 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy and honor thy father and thy mother. And you're going to find that those two positives are always undergirded with a lot of negatives as well. So you've got to remember this. Whenever God gives you a negative, you must ask what is the positive. When God gives you a positive, you must ask what is the negative. So when God says, thou shalt not commit adultery, the positive is, thou shalt live a holy, pure, and righteous, and sanctified life. When God says, thou shalt not steal, what does he mean? The positive is that you're to work with your hands, honest, diligent work that you may support and provide for yourself and also have something to give to those who have need. Likewise, when God says thou shalt not kill, the positive is thou shalt preserve life. When you get to the sixth commandment, I want you to note there are two duties, a negative and a positive. The negative is there's to be no unjust or unlawful taking of life. The positive is that you must preserve life. You are commanded to preserve life. You're obligated to preserve life. Let me put it to you like this. Based upon the sixth commandment, self-defense is obligatory. We must defend ourselves in order to obey God's law. We're obligated to defend ourselves. If we do not defend ourselves, we're going to be guilty of violating the sixth commandment. Reason like this. God has given us a duty and an obligation not to kill. From that duty and that obligation, we infer that we have a duty not to kill ourselves and not to allow ourselves to be killed. So in order then to obey the sixth commandment, in order to preserve my life, I must defend my life even to the point of taking someone else's life, if necessary, in order to obey the sixth commandment. So if we do not defend ourselves, then we're not preserving our lives. If we're not preserving our lives, then we're violating the sixth commandment, which God says thou shalt not kill. If Henry came up to me and said, now, pastor, I'm upset with you. I don't like you. I'm just going to kill you. Oh. Do you think I should just stand there, stand there and say, well, now, brother, just do whatever spins your wheels? I mean, you know, go ahead and do it. No, I'm not going to do that. If Henry comes up to me and says, you're going to kill me, uh, he's going to kill me, I'm going to say, I don't think so. You may do it, but you're going to have a hard time doing it because I'm going to fight you tooth and nail. Why? Because I have a responsibility to preserve my life. Self-defense is obligatory based upon the sixth commandment. Let me point something else out before we get into scripture. Uh, those of us who were in the military, you will probably remember Article 3 of the United States Military Code. Let me read it to you. Think about this. Article 3. If I am captured, I will continue to resist by all means available. I will make every effort to escape and to aid others to escape. I will accept neither parole nor special favors from the enemy. Now, why do you think Article 3 of the United States Military Code says this? If I am captured... I will continue to resist by all means available. I will make every effort to escape and to aid others to escape. Why would you take an oath to endeavor to escape and help others to escape? Is it because your commander just wants you to come back with new information for him? No. Article 3 of the military code is based upon the sixth commandment. You have a duty to preserve your life. You have a duty and an obligation to protect your life. If you remain in a prison camp, what is most likely to happen? You will die. The best thing then is to try to escape. Now, very obviously, Article 3 is based upon the Sixth Commandment. So let's ask ourselves, is self-defense wicked and wrong? Is it unbiblical? I remember years ago I was preaching up north and uh, I was dealing with Romans 13. And I just happened to mention something about self-defense. 
And after the service is over, a man came up with his wife and a bunch of little children. And he said that uh, he did not believe in self-defense. I said, oh? I said, what would happen if someone broke into your house and wanted to kill your wife and children? He said, well, he said, I, I guess I would just have to let him kill them because I don't believe in taking another man's life. I said, sir, all I can say to you is I'm glad I'm not married to you and I'm glad I'm not your child. Here was someone who had no clue about the Word of God. Now, let's ask ourselves this question. Is it wicked and wrong to defend yourself and your family and your loved ones? Well, I believe it is safe to follow our Lord's example. Our Heavenly Father should be emulated. So I want you to turn in your Bibles very quickly to 2 Kings chapter 19. 2 Kings chapter 19. And look at verse 34. 2 Kings 19, verse 34. And let's see what God the Father says. 2 Kings 19. Notice if you would please verse 34. We're going to turn to several passages, so please follow. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 34. Look what God says. God says, For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Now, what did God say? I will defend this city. He's talking about Jerusalem. I will defend it. So God tells Hezekiah, king of Judah, he's going to defend Jerusalem and the people therein from the Assyrians. Hezekiah does not need to worry. He does not need to fret. God will undertake for the defense. Now, let me tell you, if self-defense was wicked and wrong in and of itself, would God be defending the city or defending his people? If the defense of others was wicked and wrong, would God be doing it? No. Look in 2 Kings 20 and verse 6. Look what he says again. 2 Kings 20, verse 6. God tells Hezekiah, And I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for mine own sake, And for my servant David's sake. Again, God says, I am going to defend this city. Turn over in your Bibles to Isaiah 31. Isaiah 31. Isaiah 31. And look, if you would please, at verse 5. Isaiah 31, verse 5. It's interesting how many times God gives us the same principle. But in Isaiah 31 and verse 5... God says, as birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it, and passing over, he will preserve it. So God says, again, he's going to defend Jerusalem. And his defense will indeed be effectual, for in defending it, he will deliver it. Look in Isaiah 37 and verse 35. Isaiah 37, verse 35. God says again, For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Now, let me ask you, did God defend Jerusalem? And the answer is, yes, he did. Yes, he did. Look in Isaiah 38 in verse 6. Isaiah 38 in verse 6, again God says, I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. Now, let's ask a question. Since I've shown you all of these verses where God says he's going to defend Jerusalem, he's going to defend it for his honor and for his servant David's sake, the question you must ask is this, did God actually kill people In the defense of Jerusalem. Well, if you'll look in Isaiah 37 and verse 36, you'll find the answer to that. Isaiah 37, verse 36. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. What? What? God sent an angel and killed 185,000.
thousand Assyrians in one night. Let me ask you, could God have defended Jerusalem without killing those Assyrian soldiers? Well, of course. Don't you remember in one instance, when the Syrians were attacking Israel, God made them hear the sound like the sound of chariots, and they said, it's the Ethiopians, they've been hired against us, and the Syrians fled and left everything. No one was killed then. Could God have defended Jerusalem like that and, and made the uh, Assyrians hear horses and chariots coming and flee? Yes, but he didn't. He killed 185,000 Assyrians. Now let me ask you, who's going to be so blasphemous as to charge God with murder? Who's going to be so blasphemous as to tell God he was wrong in taking those lives. You know, David said in Psalm 7 and verse 10, My defense is of God who saveth the upright in heart. David, over and over in the Bible, claims God is his defender. In Psalm 59 verse 9 and verse 16 and verse 17, again, God says that, uh, David says that God is my defense. In Psalm 62 verse 2 and verse 6. In Psalm 94 verse 22, David says that God is his defense. What is he saying? I'm relying upon the power and the mercy of God to defend me. In fact, in Psalm 89, in verse 18, let me just quote it. David said, For the Lord is our defense, and the Holy One of Israel is our King. Notice he said, The Lord is our defense. We may rightly conclude that God not only defends His people, but He also defends His honor and His cause. It is never wrong to emulate our Heavenly Father. When life must be taken, it must be taken upon God's terms. And when it's taken upon God's terms, it is not murder. Now, I can hear an objection. I can hear someone saying, oh, yes, Brother Weaver, I understand. God did kill those 185,000 Syrians. I understand that. But what God does and what we do are two different things. We are not God. Well, that's true. We are not God. And we never will be God. But I can show you something in Scripture. I can show you that the same sovereign, holy, righteous God enabled and empowered His people to take the lives of their enemies. In fact, if you look in your Bibles to the book of Judges chapter 10... And verse 1. I'm not going to take the time to go through the book of Judges. But I want you to see this one. Judges chapter 10 verse 1. Look what the scripture says. Judges 10 verse 1. Judges 10 verse 1. And after Abimelech there arose to defend Israel... Tola, the son of Puah, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shamir in Mount Ephraim. Now watch. And after Abimelech there arose, what are those next words? To defend Israel. You know what the book of Judges is about? The book of Judges is about God raising up men who became judges. And these judges always led the people in fighting against their enemies. Wow. When they fought against their enemies, their enemies died. I don't care where you read in the book of Judges. God raised up those judges so that they might defend Israel. If you would turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel 23. In 2 Samuel 23... We have a listing of David's mighty men. It's a tremendous chapter. And let's begin reading just with verse 8. And we'll read through verse 12. I'm not going to take time to read all of these mighty men. And they were quite powerful men, I might add. 2 Samuel 23, verse 8. 
These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Tachamite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains, the same was Adino the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were going away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto his sword, and the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. And after him was Shema, the son of Agi, the Harahite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop, where was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord wrought a great victory. Now, let me just point out the fact. Here are some of David's mighty men that are listed. Uh, the interesting thing is, Eleazar, the son of uh, Dodo, the Ahohite, he stood and fought the Philistines, the Bible says, until his hand clave unto his sword. His hand was weary. I don't know how many he killed. But I want you to note something. Look in verse 10. He arose, we're talking about Eliezer now. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. Wait a minute. I thought it was Eliezer that was doing the fighting. I thought it was Eliezer that was doing the killing. Well, it was. Well, how did the Lord work a great miracle? Because it was the Lord who was enabling and empowering Eliezer to fight. If you'll skip down to verse 11. And after him was Shema, the son of Ag the Harahite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. But he, Shema, stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And here it is again. And the Lord wrought a great, great victory. How did God work a great victory? How did God bring it to pass? It was Shema who was doing the fighting. But it was God who was enabling him and empowering him to fight. Note, if you would, please, it was the Lord who wrought the great victory. Who made these men great? Who made these men such powerful fighters? Who gave them the ability to fight and defend? The answer is, it was God. And consequently, in each instance, God gets the honor and the glory. Now let me just point out the fact, and I will hit this next week a little more strongly. But we have to use the weapons that God places in our hands. But at the same time, we must trust in the Lord to make those weapons effectual. Now, these men use swords. They use bows and spears and whatever else. But it was not their bow nor their spear that delivered them. It was God who delivered them. It was God who made the weapon effectual. Let me, let me just show you what I'm getting at. Suppose if you ask me, do you have a loaded weapon in your bedroom? And I answered, yes. Then you're going to say, well, since you've got a loaded weapon in your bedroom, you are trusting in that loaded weapon. No, I'm not. The loaded weapon is worthless and useless in and of itself. I could have 40 shotguns in my bedroom. I could have 40 rifles. I could have 100 handguns. I could even have a cannon in my bedroom. But let me tell you, none of those things would help me if God doesn't awaken me in time or enable me to shoot straight. You see what I'm saying? It's God who must make it effectual. Now, I'm just trying to show you that self-defense is indeed biblical. I'm going to show you that defending the lives of others is biblical as well. If you look in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 7, someone says, oh, but all of that's Old Testament. You know, I get aggravated at people who say that because we have one Bible, not two. And the Old Testament is just as much the Word of God as the New Testament. But here it is in the New Testament in Acts chapter 7. 
Let's begin reading there, verse 22. Everyone knows a story about Moses. Acts chapter 7, verse 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. And when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. Now the Bible says here he smote him. You know that he killed him. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver him, but they understood not. Let me point something out. Very interesting. Neither in the Old Testament nor in the New Testament is Moses ever condemned for killing this Egyptian. Let me say it again. Neither in the Old Testament nor in the New Testament is Moses ever condemned for killing the Egyptian. In fact, you could say that Moses was commended for killing the Egyptian. Why? Because God listed Moses in the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. You say, oh, but Brother Weaver, Moses had to flee Egypt. Yes, he did. But not because he violated God's law, but because of the tyranny and despotism of Pharaoh. Pharaoh was going to kill Moses because Moses had killed an Egyptian. Moses didn't have to flee because he had broken God's law. He had to flee because a tyrant was after him and was going to take his life for doing that which was right. I want you to look in your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Samuel 17. You know this story. This is where David meets Goliath. We've heard that ever since we were children. 1 Samuel 17. Look, if you would, please. You remember how David now has come to the army. There's been a standoff and a standstill because Goliath, this great giant, keeps challenging the Israelites, send me a man that we may fight. If I kill him, you be our servants. If he kills me, we'll be your servants. Everybody's afraid of Goliath, but not David. And David said, look, uh, God delivered me out of the hand of a bear. He delivered me out of the hand of a lion. This uncircumcised Philistine, hey, I'll take care of him just like I did that lion, just like I did that bear with God's grace and God's help. So, you know the story. Now, David has the sling. And notice, if you would please, in verse 43 of 1 Samuel 17, how the Philistine purposefully presses the attack and threatens David. Watch. 1 Samuel 17, verse 43. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh into the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will deliver you into our hands. Now I want you to note something. The Philistine told David, you come to me, young man. Come on. I'm not necessarily interested in killing young, young teenagers, young boys, but, but I'll kill you. You come on to me. I'll, I'll take your life. And what did David say? David said, look, you've come to me with a sword and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. And David said, listen, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take your head. Now, let me ask you a question. Did David intend on killing Goliath when he went out there? Yes, he did. But you say David didn't have a sword. I know that. But David put that rock in that sling, hit him right between the eyes, knocked him out, walked up to Goliath, took his own sword and cut his head off. And what did David say? The battle is the Lord's. Would you like to answer the question, 
who empowered David to kill Goliath? It was God. Was the death of Goliath murder? No. Goliath's life and the life of those Philistines were taken in self-defense. David was defending himself and the armies of Israel and the people at home. Goliath's life was taken lawfully in obedience to the sixth commandment. You remember the sixth commandment has that positive, thou shalt preserve life. Now let me show you. Look in your Bibles, if you would, please, the Exodus chapter 22. Exodus 22. And let me show you what God's law very plainly teaches. Exodus 22. And let's begin reading there with verse 1. Exodus 22, verse 1. God says, if a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. Now, let me just point this out. Uh, Exodus 22 is the law of restitution. And in the law of restitution, God gives us here several scenarios. He says in verse 2, look at it, If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. So, here's a thief that's breaking in at night. You can't identify him. You can't see well enough to know whether he's armed or not. He may be coming through your window. He may be coming through your door. He may already be in your house. What does God say? God says, kill him. If you kill him, there shall no blood be shed for him. He ought not to have been in the house. He ought not to have been coming through the door or coming through the window. He was breaking into a man's private property. Now, let me just show you something. In reality, God's law is far more extensive than man's law. Let me show you. Go back to verse 1. If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If a thief be found breaking up or breaking in and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. Let me ask you, do oxen and sheep stay in the house? No, they stay in the barn. So here's just somebody breaking onto your property, not necessarily in your house, and it's at night. You don't know who he is. You don't know whether he's armed or not. God says his life may be lawfully taken. It's not murder. But look at verse 3. If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be stole for his theft. Now God says if the thief is there in the daytime, you don't kill him. If you kill him, then his blood's going to be required at your hand. Why? Well, in the daytime, number one, you can identify him. Number two, in the daytime, you can tell whether he's armed or not. If he's unarmed and you can identify him, there's no reason to shoot him. God says he's to be captured, caught. Restitution, he's got to restore fourfold. If he has nothing, he's to be sold for his theft. Now, there is a way that you may lawfully kill him in the daytime. What would that be? If he is armed and threatens your life, then that would be self-defense. You know, it is amazing to me, and I'm going to use the word, how ignorant most Christians are when it comes to the biblical doctrine of self-defense. Years ago, I was in South Carolina, and a Christian came to me, and he asked this question. He said, Brother Weaver, what would you do 
If you woke up during the night and a man was climbing through your bedroom window, my answer was, that depends. He said, depends upon what? I said, well, it depends upon whether or not I could get my hands on a gun. If I get my hands on a gun, I would shoot him. If I couldn't get my hands on a gun, I'd get my hands on a baseball bat and I'd beat him in the head. He said, well, I don't think you ought to do that. I said, what do you think I should do? He said, these are his words exactly. I think you should go in another room and pray about it. I said, you mean to tell me you think I should be in another room praying while a man's either in there raping my wife or killing her and my children? I said, sir, I will tell you, I would pray. I really would. I'd pull that baseball bat back and I'd say, dear God, don't let me miss him this time. Pow! That's how I'd pray. That's what God says. If someone's found breaking in, you don't know him. You don't know whether he's armed or not. God says, your life is in danger. You have the right to preserve your life and the life of your family. Now, let me show you how extensive this is. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy 22. Deuteronomy 22. And let's begin reading there verse 23. And we will read through verse 27. Deuteronomy 22, beginning there with verse 23. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 23. Look what the Bible says. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then you shall bring them both out into the gate of that city, and you shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so shalt thou put away evil from among you. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But in the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death, for as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so it is in this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. Now, I hope you've noticed the difference between the two scenarios that the Lord gives. He said, first of all, here's a young woman in the city. She's betrothed. And a man takes her and lies with her. God says, in that instance... You take both the man and the woman outside and put them to death. Now, wait a minute. The second scenario is the man finds the young damsel in the field. Does the same thing. But now God says the man only is to be put to death, not the damsel. What's the difference? Here's the difference. In the first scenario... The woman was in the city. Notice if you would, look if you would, what the Bible says. Deuteronomy 22, beginning there, verse 23. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed in a husband and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then you shall bring them both out into the gate of the city and you shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, are you looking? Because she cried not being in the city. I want to tell you what the implications are. First of all, if the woman did not cry, she was consenting to the sin and the crime and worthy of death. Secondly, note this. If she was not consenting to the sin and the crime, she would have cried. What does that mean? That means this. Listen. If she had cried aloud, that means anyone who heard her would have had the duty and the obligation and the responsibility to save her. When you come down to the second scenario, the man finds a young woman in the field and the Bible says she cried out, but there was none to deliver. God says, therefore, the man only is to be put to death. So what God is telling us is this. We have a responsibility 
Not only to protect our lives and preserve our lives, but for the lives of others who are in danger as well. Many of you will remember. But in 1964, there was a horrible murder. Kitty Genovese was brutally murdered. She was stabbed 17 times, raped, robbed, and left for dead on the street. The whole time she was screaming and begging for help. 38 people witnessed at least part, some all of the attack. And the most any of them would do was to call the cops. Who, of course, got there after the woman was dead. Now, let me tell you something. According to biblical law, the 38 who watched her raped, murdered, and robbed are just as guilty before God as the man who did it. For they stood by and did nothing to preserve life. You say, Brother Weaver, that was 1964. Oh, listen. June 27th, 2008. Cars slow to watch teens beat homeless men to death. Car slowed down and watched some teenagers beat a man to death so they could steal his radio and his headphones. No one lifted a finger. How about this one? June 25th, 2008, Philadelphia. Here was a woman who was robbed and raped repeatedly. In her own apartment as she went in, a man grabbed her, forced her into the room. Three others followed. She screamed and the neighbor said, well, I just thought she tripped and fell. That's why she was continually screaming. No one even called the cops for four hours. <clears throat> the point I'm trying to make is this, folks. God demands that life be preserved. I want to show you how fastidious God is. I want you to turn to two passages. One of them you're close to. Deuteronomy 24 and Exodus 23. Go ahead and find both those passages. Find Exodus 23 and hold it. We'll come back there. But let's look at Deuteronomy 24 and verse 4. Uh, Deuteronomy 22, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 4. Look what God says, Deuteronomy 22, verse 4. God says, Thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or his ox fall down by the way and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt surely help him to lift them up again. Wait. Thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or his ox fall down by the way and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt surely help him to lift them up again. What is God saying? God says, Here you're going down the road. And you see that my horse is out in the road. God says, you can't pretend like you didn't see that horse. You must help me get that horse back into the pen before a car kills him. And maybe someone else get hurt in the automobile. Or if you see my cow in danger, you, you can't hide yourself. God says, you have a responsibility. Now, I want you to understand, he's talking about animals here. You say, now wait a minute, Brother Weaver. I'd be more than happy and glad and willing to help my brother, especially with anything that's his. Okay. Now look in Exodus chapter 23, and let's begin reading there with verse 4. Exodus 23, verse 4. Look what God says. If thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. If thou see the ass of him that hateth thee lying under his burden, and wouldest forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help with him. Ah, oh, now it's not your brother, now it's your enemy. 
Now your enemy's horse is out. Now your enemy's cow is out. Now your enemy's cow is having a calf and having difficulty. What does God say? You cannot hide yourself. You must help preserve the animal's life. Let me ask you, why does God give us these truths concerning these animals? Here is why. It's an argument from the less to the greater. If you are obligated to help preserve the life of my animals, how much more are you obligated to help preserve my life? If you're obligated to help to preserve your enemy's life, not somebody who's trying to kill you, but somebody who just doesn't like you. If you're obligated to help to preserve the lives of his animals, how much more are you obligated to help to preserve his life? You see, it doesn't matter where you turn in the Word of God, Old Testament, New Testament. Self-defense is obligatory. The preservation of life is just and right and holy and biblical. It is mandatory. It is required by the law of God. Now let me make just one application today. And I'm going to take care of the main objection, Lord willing, next week. But I want you to consider this simple truth. Have you noticed... That God has created in animals an ability to defend themselves and their families. Alice and I used to live in Greenville, South Carolina, and we had a hedge, and a mockingbird had made a nest in that hedge, and of course, it's only three feet off the ground. Our neighbor had a big old tomcat. That old tomcat comes stalking and walking by. That mockingbird would come out of that bush, peck his head until she ran him out of the yard. You say, that was a mean mockingbird. No, it wasn't a mean mockingbird. She was just defending her family. She was defending her babies. I get so tickled at people who've never been raised on a farm especially when they try to pick up a baby pig. Now, if you don't think a sow can be mean, you pick, her, uh, her, pick up her pig and let that pig start squealing. She's going to come after you. You know, the only way that you can pick up a pig and him not squeal, you know that? Pick him up by his tail. He'll never squeal. You put your hand under there to pick him up, I got news for you, that sow will eat you up. My father... What deer hunting. And a four-point buck came by and Dad shot him with .30-06. Some automatic rifle. Dad got out of his tree, walked over to where the deer was, and the deer was not dead. And so Dad then aimed at him to finish him off. And his rifle had malfunctioned and it had jammed. He couldn't get it. And while he was working with the rifle trying to get a new shell in the chamber, the buck got up, lowered his head, did like this, and charged my dad. You know what dad did? Dad took that 30 alt 6 and broke it over his head. Killed the deer, broke the stock on the rifle. I still have the rifle today. I repaired the stock. But you say, that was a mean deer. That wasn't a mean deer. That deer was just defending his life. And in other words, it would be a terrible anomaly if God allowed animals to defend their lives and their families... And did not allow us to do the same. Do you know even little sparrows will defend their young? You know what our Lord said in Matthew 10 and verse 31? He said this, Fear not, therefore, you are more valuable than many sparrows. If sparrows may lawfully defend themselves, then dear friend, may I point out that we may lawfully defend ourselves. Self-defense is obligatory. The law of God demands it. He who will not defend himself is in violation of the sixth commandment. For the sixth commandment is, thou shalt preserve life. 
Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we bow to Thee this day. We ask, Lord, for Your grace and for Your mercy. We ask that You would teach us. Build us up in the most holy faith. Give us grace, Lord, that we may serve Thee acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Give us understanding that we may order our lives and bring our lives in conformity to Your Word. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask and pray. Amen.